All right, so without further ado, um, we have Eric Troutman, CEO of the NEAR Foundation, uh, with a keynote speech on the state of the NEAR ecosystem and the things to come. So Eric, uh, welcome to the stage. How's everyone doing? I guess it's still early after last night. So thus far, you've, you've had a chance to hear from a lot of people across a lot of different spectra. Uh, you've had people talking about technology. You've had people talking about products, about NFTs, about art. And I think all of these are fantastic avenues to explore in greater depth what's going on inside the NEAR ecosystem. Uh, what I wanted to do was actually cover something that's a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit softer. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't actually tie down to the details of what you've seen in these other talks. So we're going to get a little bit weird. Um, so really what I, what I want to dive into is basically what is the weird stuff that sets NEAR apart? Like why, why, why is it that, that this is actually the right ecosystem for all of this to occur? Why is it that this is the place where this vision is going to go? And why is it that everyone is here? Um, the most important question is actually bigger than the details. Uh, when I talk to people, so this is, this is the first major in-person event that we've had in two years uh, for the NEAR ecosystem, and the first one that, that probably most people here have ever been to, because two years ago, the ecosystem was approximately 25 people. And so this is where it gets a little weird. So the book that, that you could see up there, it's called Home for a Bunny. And that was, that was actually the first book that I ever read aloud. And it's the story of a bunny. It's about 24 pages long. It's the story of a bunny who goes looking for a home. And it tries out, it talks to the toad, it talks to the birds, it talks to uh, all sorts of animals, and it can't find its home until the very end when it finds another rabbit and ends up in a rabbit hole. And they live happily ever after. Um, and I think what's important here is that when, when I talk to people and I ask them, why, why is it that you're here? Why is this actually an interesting place for you to be a part of? They don't talk about scalable technology. They don't talk about sharding. They don't talk about anything. What they talk about is energy. What they say is that this is the place where it actually feels like it used to feel back in the day. This is what it feels like. This is what it felt like 10 years ago in the technology industry. I don't, so I don't know uh, when everyone here kind of got involved, but for me, my journey came through finance, and that's a very different world. And when I first took a step away from finance, the first thing that I did was I went to a meetup. This was in Houston, Texas in probably 2011. And the difference that I experienced talking to people in the tech industry versus people in the finance industry was mind-blowing. Because we walked in, and the first thing that people wanted to know was, how can I help? What are you building? Oh, that's cool. How can we, how can we collaborate? What are you working on? Right? Like that energy, that energy was something that was so special 10 years ago. And I think in the ensuing decade, it's actually, it's, it's been harder and harder to capture that feeling in the traditional tech industry. Uh, this is, you know, we went through the mobile revolution, we went through social, and I think we've gotten to the point where everyone has acknowledged to some degree or another that we've topped out in a lot of places in traditional technology. And more importantly, culturally, it's actually become almost antagonistic to some of the things that, that everyone who was in that early days actually fundamentally believed. So I think what, what I want to emphasize here is that we're all kind of looking for a home as well. Everyone here is an investor. You're an investor of your time. You're an investor of your attention. And everyone here, whether, whether it's explicit or implicit, you're kind of looking for the right place for you to invest your energy, for you to, to create the future that you want. And that's because all of us are impatient. We're here because it's still early days, right? This is... <laughs> We're, if you were patient, you would wait until this was already built, and then you'd use it. But this is where we're builders. And building, building doesn't necessarily just mean developers. It doesn't necessarily just mean uh, technologists. It means everyone who wants to be a part of, of constructing a bigger vision and, and making that into a reality. And we're impatient. And that's why. That's why we're in this. Um, so what is that vision? So basically... Everyone here has, has probably your own version of what that looks like. 
Um, you know, very rarely would I expect anyone here to sort of explicitly say, well, what we're looking for is a world where we give back control. It's a world where we give people control of their assets, of their data, or of their power of governance. And in some ways, those are almost buzzwords at this point. And it can be hard to parse what those actually mean. Um, but in the end, when you look at it, when everything rolls up, that's actually what we're going for. And this kind of takes us back to that bigger vision, that sense of, of like, what, are we building something that's collaborative? Are we building something that's life affirming? Are we building something that's net positive for the world? And it's real too. It's not just abstract. And I think the place where it, where it becomes real right now, at least in the last year we've seen this develop more and more, is in the creator economy. And so what we have here is, is essentially the triangle that sort of defines what are the key components that make up the creator economy. And so that control, it starts on the top with creators, with NFTs. NFTs are just a container, right? It's a container where you can put IP in. And when you give creators back their control of their IP, suddenly everything, everything becomes possible in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, communities. So DAOs, DAOs and fungible tokens, um, the, ability, the ability to uh, create new toolkits for communities uh, and organize them around common causes, that's something that's new. That's something that's real, and that's giving control to communities. And that's giving communities the ability to actually uh, become real, almost like real co-ops in a way that hasn't been possible before, which allows them to organize, which allows them to take on business models, which allows them to be bigger than just a meetup group or a Facebook group that's, that's on someone else's platform. And of course, underneath all of this is finance. And the control there is, is giving people control to take their money where they want. And that's, also, that's obviously something that's been spoken about a lot in the blockchain space, but it's also fundamental to the creator economy because, of course, that's what kind of lubricates everything underneath the surface and makes it possible to have an economy. Um, so the vision isn't necessarily new. We've, we've heard a lot of this before. If you're around in 2017, which, which most of you probably at least Saw, saw the edges of it, whether or not you experienced it directly. Uh, we had a lot of these great ideas, and I say we as just sort of a general collective, as an industry. A lot of these ideas have been around for a long time. And the problem was the technology wasn't really there. Um, and so what's different, though, is scale. What's different is the ability to actually take on and, and realize this vision at a scale that wasn't possible before. In 2017, we kind of got over our skis, did a bit of a face plant. Uh, that's OK. But we're coming back. And ultimately, that's actually what NIR is here for. Um, so NIR, NIR is basically uh, the substrate, the, 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 the network that's designed to support that vision of the new future. Um, and it's a lot of things. It's not just the technology. It's bigger. And, and that, I think, is one of the things that I want to I wanna really emphasize here. And I'll talk about the technology, because it's still important. Um, but NIR is more than that, and it's about, it's about bringing us back to the days when we could imagine a new future, when we, could, when we could actually participate in something that was bigger and we could feel like we were doing good by doing that. And I think the key part here is, is also just a bit of a checkpoint, because even though we were ahead of our, ourselves in 2017, it's still early. Web 3 is basically the size of a zit on the sun compared to the real web. Um, it's, the major opportunity is, is in Web 2 not Web3 right now. It's sort of merging the two. It's, it's how do we make sure that Web3 is actually the, the underpinning of the broader Web2. Um, but we haven't, we haven't even gotten close. Um, the prize is huge. The prize is, is, is billions of people and giving them the same thing, giving them the power, giving them control. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the crossing the chasm model. I'm, I think at this point it's, it's become uh, pretty ubiquitous. Um, but it's basically the idea that markets have to go through stages and I think what's, what's, not, what's not in this model is, is the optimism of, of people in the markets and assuming that they've crossed far further than we actually have. And we see that again and again. And of course, I'm, I, I, I live on optimism as much as everyone else does. Um, but in terms of being realistic, I think it's also healthy for us to, to understand that this is early. And even though, even though the eventual prize is a billion people, we have a lot of work to do to get there. And that's OK, because what's cool about that is, that is that the people in this room, the people in this ecosystem, the people in this community are the ones who are actually going to take us there. That means that there's opportunity. It means this hasn't been done yet. And there's so much opportunity inherent in all of that. We've, we've made skirmishes across the chasm. We, we, we've seen uh, NFTs break through the mainstream front page of New York Times. We've seen, um, we've seen uh, for instance, NBA Top Shot. We got a lot of people coming out of the, the consumer web starting to try these things out, play to earn, Axie Infinity, all of this. I think of these as almost skirmishes because, because they're sort of, they're, they're like proofs of concept that busted through. 
Um, but they never, but they still haven't fully, fully landed that beachhead and gotten us to the point where your brother, your mother, anybody is, is, is just onboarding to this stuff, using it and using it every day. Uh, and the other thing worth noting though is, is this is actually where it does come back to technology because the tooling or the, uh, the underlying technology matters. We've already seen the limitations of a lot of platforms that have come before and we're not even close to where we need to be. So it's something worth keeping in mind that, that this is a long-term game and the design decisions that are made early are the ones that actually bear fruit years down the road. When you, start, when you start to see limitations in certain design decisions and you start to see limitations in certain cultural decisions, and that's why it's so important that in early days that this, this group, that we're able to kind of align behind the right things. And so I think all of this really starts with first principles. And so to get to a billion, you have to keep it simple. And you have to, you have to really work backwards from first principles. And so for us, that's, that's been pretty obvious from day one. I mean, we got our start in, uh, in San Francisco, and the culture out there is really about making something people want. That's, that's a famous Y Combinator quote or logo or slogan. Um, but what's different that, that we need to do is we're not here, we, again, speaking on behalf of a collective that I actually have no right to speak on behalf of. Um, we, we aren't just here to make something people want. We're here to help other people make something people want. We're an ecosystem, and we're a collaborative ecosystem. So that's why it's not about individuals. It's about the ecosystem first. And we've made distinct decisions that support that. Um, it, in, order to, in order to get to a billion, you have, to, you, have to, you have to lift other people up. You have to get back to that original tech industry mentality of, of, of one plus one equals three. Uh, you have to be open. You have to be pragmatic. There's, you, you can't be dogmatic. You can't be, be closed-minded. It's about open, the open source ethos. It's about, it's about sharing knowledge, sharing education, right? empowering other people. It's still early days. You have to be always growing, always evolving. And ultimately, the most important thing is to break through, to get across that chasm. Obviously, you have to make sure that this isn't about the technology. This is about the users. This is working backwards from the journeys that matter. This is remembering that, that real people don't care about technology. Real people care about what they want, whatever that is in the moment, whether it's playing a game or, or accessing their money, uh, making a transaction. Um, so what we're actually, what we need to design for is making it feel simple. It doesn't have to be simple. In fact, that makes it harder. That's a much bigger design goal, is to make it feel simple. It's easy to design something that's, that's complex, that feels complex. It's extremely difficult to design something that's complex but feels simple. And so I guess I just wanna, I wanna benchmark there and come back to that, that, that these principles matter. And so this is the part where I think the technology actually has to come back into the picture a little bit. Because the core design decisions, like I said, matter. Um, so I don't know how many people are aware of what the original story of Near was, and I won't go into the details of it. But basically, it got started in the summer of 2018, which, which as far as a layer one protocol goes, is quite a late entrant. Uh, most of these protocols got started way back, you know, 2014, 15, 16. Well, I mean, obviously Ethereum. Um, but 2018, that was coming off of the big bull run. That was coming off of that that over the skis face plant. Uh, that we made as an industry, and uh, that was a time when, when the hammer that everyone was hitting was scalability. It's about TPS, 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 and I call that the summer of TPS because I remember every white paper that came out had a higher number. It was, it was, it was, you know, who, who, who can theoretically design a hundred TPS, a thousand TPS, a million TPS? It was crazy. And the team here, we we were impatient builders like anyone else. Uh, the core group of people who got together in a in a tiny WeWork room that smelled like armpits was, you know, Eugene, <laughs> Ilya, Alex, Bowen, uh, Sasha, <laughs> Pi Guy. Um, we, were, we were impatient builders. We, we, we didn't see anything. They didn't see anything that, that, that allowed them to actually build what they wanted to build um, and, and realized that, that we had a solution um, based on prior work at MemSQL, which uh, a number of the team members had done on sharded database systems, which could theoretically deliver a more or less infinite level of TPS. But at the same time, it's kind of ridiculous because, like, who cares, right? Like, why, why, why is TPS the thing that we're going? And by the way, TPS transactions per second for everyone uh, who, who, who's not familiar. Um, but what actually matters is working backwards from from those first principles. Um, and it was kind of crazy because we kind of entered a religious war at that time, <laughs> and and not coming out with a number and not saying that you know this is this is the level of TPS that Near is going to deliver and we promise it at this date was was a really strange approach to take. Um, but the stranger thing was actually that TPS doesn't, isn't the most important thing that matters. 
uh, when we started talking to people, when you start to think and you work backwards from, actually what we're here to do is make stuff that helps other people build things people want, which is a bit of a mouthful, what matters is usability. And so it doesn't matter if you build the biggest stadium in the world that can seat 100 million people. If it's built out in the middle of the desert and no one can get there, your usability sucks. Um, so what you actually have to do is you have to build technology so that the developer, years down the road, can create experiences that users can actually use. And that requires a lot of things. That requires onboarding that feels like Web 2. That requires the ability to build experiences that are engaging in a way that you can't actually get from Web 2. Because obviously, it has to be 10x better. Otherwise, they're not even going to use it. And as importantly, and this is something I'll talk about a little bit later, you also need to make sure that these products have growth engines so that they can actually reach more consumers. Because again, it's not, it's not about just the technology. It's about building successful businesses that reach consumers. And that's where when you work backwards, you know, OK, well, what we need from the platform that supports all of that is it has to be secure, obviously. We're dealing with a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of value, a lot of assets. Uh, it has to be scalable. I mean, that's not to say that TPS is a problem. TPS is just an, a cost of entry. I mean, it, it, it's important. Um, and so that, that, was, that was the entry point that we had, was, OK, well, we have, we have a sharding design that supports that. Um, but again, that comes back to simple. How do we make the technology feel simple? How do we make it feel simple for developers? How do we make it ultimately so those developers can create experiences that feel simple for end users? And that's where when you work all the way back down, backwards from the first principles, that's where you get to, OK, well, if it's going to be secure and scalable, you better have a sharding approach, because you don't know what the level of TPS on the platform that it's going to have to support is. And you obviously need to make sure it can, through, through that level of scaling, that it can support the kinds of experience that we have. But that's also where kind of the secret sauce that, that, that doesn't get a lot of love necessarily, because it's, it's kind of hidden, is the account model on Nier. Um, the account model was, was the piece that connected scalability with usability, because the account model the contract-based accounts, being able to execute essentially arbitrary code from within the accounts, opens up the whole world. It gives developers a level of flexibility that you don't get from something that's much more statically defined. And that's, that's actually the secret sauce in a lot of ways. Um, and this is, this, this is just a screen grab, and it's, uh, you don't have to read too much into it. But, but essentially, what is the design goal of Simple? How does this all come back to reality? Um, this is, this is essentially, what is the fewest number of steps that you can actually take a user from Instagram, from the social web, and bring them into an app, get them using blockchain-based primitives without them actually even having to do anything unusual, without them having to go buy tokens, without them having to, to sign in for anything more intense than an email, and ideally not even that. And so if you want to do that, if you want to pull that off, again, it feels simple, but it's not. Underneath the surface, this is where the technology has to support you. This is where in order to pull that off, you can't pay for gas, or you, the consumer can't pay for gas fees, obviously. Uh, you have to be able to use a single sign-on model, uh, something that's much, much easier to, to sign on to. Uh, it has to scale, of course. If you, if you get the Oprah hug, that app better be able to stay up as well as any Web2 consumer-facing app. Um, you have to be able to create accounts on behalf of other people and then securely hand them off. Uh, you have to be able to, to do things on be, you have to allow the user to do things that are kind of expensive and unusual the same way that you would in a, in a, in a freemium model in, in Web2, right? Um, it's the same principles apply. It's just we, we haven't really gotten to the point previously in Web3 where, where you can get to that same level of simplicity and usability for users. And again, uh, number six, you have, to, you have to make sure that those apps can actually have growth toolkits so that those apps can reach new users. <laughs> well, that's Owen Wilson. Um, so just shifting gears real, real quickly, uh, w one thing that I hear a lot when I talk to people is, uh, oh my god, I didn't actually realize that there was so much going on with Nier. And I think there's a meme out there, or a series of memes, that great at technology, not very good at talking about it. Um, it is what it is. So, um, but there is a lot of momentum. There's a lot of momentum buzzing and bubbling beneath the surface, which of course everyone who's here in the room, you've seen that. You've seen that talking to everyone who's here. Um, but we're, we've only been out for a little over a year. And in a little over a year, we've reached 40 million transactions. We have over a million accounts. There's 100,000 community members. We have over 1,000 monthly builders building on the platform with more than 200 projects, 200 DAOs, 100 guilds, and over 45 million in funding has been distributed. This is one year. <laughs> The other thing we're not always good at is celebrating small milestones. Because when I look at this, 
I look, this looks like a far cry from a billion, but we, I guess we have to acknowledge that this is going the right direction. Um, the ecosystem has been growing phenomenally. Right? We, we've, ev every single area of it, whether it's on the technical side, on the integration side, on-ramps, off-ramps, uh, I'll talk about some of the details, right? But like, every week we have to redesign this chart because more and more companies are, are starting to participate. More and more startups are coming together. This, th this chart is on the website, so uh, if you want to see it, check it out. On the funding side, fun funding is another indicator. It's kind of a leading indicator of an ecosystem that things are happening, right? Because I'll talk about the journey in just a second. Um, but funding is happening. So we've already deployed over 120 grants from the core grant program. That's where that 45 million number comes from. Uh, we, but we've also crowdsourced. We have IDOs running, running on, uh, on Skyward. Uh, we have, we have um, a series of other IDO platforms that are coming out. We'll talk about those in a second. There's outside funding. Startups are getting funded. A number of you here are actually in funded startups. Some of you have announced and some of you haven't. And as importantly, there's a lot of community funding that's been going on. Grace and, and the community team has been doing a phenomenal job of helping people from the ground up, from the edges in, um, access capital. Because of course, we have to eat. <laughs> you can't build unless you can eat. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is, is more on the market side. So there are a few key areas. Uh, I mentioned the creator economy triangle, and I think that's pretty much uh, that, that's a good model for, for understanding sort of where are we as, a, as an ecosystem, where do we need to be. And so, the, uh, so the, first, the first component of this we're talking about is DeFi. And DeFi is usually the leader in, in a blockchain-based ecosystem, um, and for good reasons, because fundamentally it's still a financial technology. It, it, it needs the, the, the sort of the core building block is still, can we transact? Can we, can we move value, whether or not those are tokens or NFTs or, 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 or assets? Um, and so finance on near decentralized finance, I mean, it almost had sort of a coming out party maybe a, a month or two ago. And since then, since then it's been cruising. Uh, we, have, we have a series of components. And the interesting thing about DeFi, of course, is that you don't actually need that many core components, but there are almost infinite permutations of those components. Um, and so each of those IDOs, we have AMMs, liquid staking, uh, Metapool just just came out recently. A uh, series of series of announcements. Uh, I know some of these have already been made made today. Um, others are upcoming uh, for sort of filling in the core building blocks. Uh, but there's a lot going on. There's over 100 million locked in TVL, and there's more to come. On the NFT side, obviously having a million wallets is is a good place to start, because when you have when you have these accounts, the question is, can you get them to do other stuff than just participate in the app that brought them in? And that's obviously a goal. Um, but ultimately, uh, we've, we've had a lot of success uh, also in Asia. Uh, some, some NFT, I don't know if, you, uh, if you've had a chance to, to see some of the talks from Amos out in Asia, uh, in China. Um, we had a collaboration with uh, Taobao with an NFT artist that, that was sort of one of the first times that you were able to sell uh, NFTs using a conventional platform, which is sort of the Amazon of China. Uh, and then others have mentioned Human Guild is supporting over, I mean, I think this number is now low, uh, 20 games. And then we have a series of guilds that are, that are driving things on, the, um, on supporting the consumer side. Uh, for me, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is, is the community side, is DAOs. Because um, we, we've all experienced the arc of NFTs. We, ha we still, DAOs, DAOs are fresh. DAOs are new. I mean, they've been around for maybe the longest. They're also completely incomprehensible to the average human. And so what we're working to do is, Back to those first principles, how do you make a DAO feel simple? How do you make a DAO into something that real people can use, that mainstream people can use, and that actually creates value for them? How, how do you support creators by allowing their community to participate in the intellectual property that that creator creates? How do you, how do you, how do you give them value for being early? How do you give them shared incentives? Um, th th these are tools that we haven't had before, and these are things that are starting to come out. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to see the talk by Jordan, uh, who's running the Astro, Astro DAO or Astro uh, tool, basically. Um, and that's basically, that's built on top of the core Sputnik DAO, pro, uh, DAO contract. And that's basically designed, how do we get DAOs to back as many consumer-oriented communities as possible, um, up, and down the spec, up and down the spectrum. A um, lot of really cool stuff there. But even so, um, we've distributed funding of over $7 million through over 200 uh, Sputnik DAOs on NIR. And when you look at the numbers, um, obviously the the dollar value will go up, but the fact that there are 200 communities on NIR that are already working, that are already voting and distributing funding is something that you don't see actually in a lot of ecosystems. 
So we're getting there, and they've done things. They've done things from from you know paying for for actions within the ecosystem to things that are totally outside the ecosystem, like COVID relief for for India or Vietnam. Uh, and then the other piece of this is uh, interoperability, which I think is something that that uh, it's always a little bit hard for people to fit together, because the question is always you know what, why interoperate. But the point here is. Like, if this is technology that's designed to work for everybody, that's designed to kind of break through and touch consumers, we need to welcome everybody in from all sides. And so that's where, that's where Aurora and Octopus help apps come into the Near ecosystem and take advantage of a lot of the, the core tools, core primitives, core value that's stored in the Near ecosystem from other areas. Um, so Aurora is, is a fantastic piece of technology that's built on top of Near that's actually an Ethereum layer 2 that uses ETH as its base token. It's pretty incredible. And they've been, they've been roaring out of the gate. And there's a lot of momentum behind them. Um, Octopus is, is almost on the other side. And that's, that's focusing on app chains. That's focusing on uh, who, who, who out there is trying to build slightly more complicated applications um, using Substrate and, and allowing them to hook into the Near ecosystem as well. And then, of course, the Rainbow Bridge is about bringing assets in. But if, so kind of coming back to all of this, it's like, why should you, take, why should you be here? Why should you join this? Um, but, Everyone has a part in this equation of what does it take to actually build a successful startup, to build a successful consumer-facing experience. I mean, if we're, if, if we're going to realize the goal of, of reaching a billion consumers, a billion people, we're going to need a lot of really big apps. We're going to need a lot of very successful apps. And to get there, it takes, it takes a village. Um, and so one of the, through, through the life cycle stages of, of a startup, and we've had a lot of experience at this point talking to, talking to founders along the way, uh, understanding a lot more about the pain points of building in Web3, or also the pain points of building towards Web2 from within Web3, or vice versa. Um, it takes a lot. Uh, it starts with funding. Um, we, we had a major announcement yesterday about $800 million worth of funding that's going towards the ecosystem. Uh, it's an overall package. Um, and that's, that's kind of the core ingredient, right? Again, you can't build unless you can eat. And there are a lot of ways that, that this is being distributed. Uh, the most important thing is that this is actually being distributed towards the edges, though. Um, you can, uh, you'll be able to see this online. I think in terms of in, it's basically oriented towards how do, we, how do we support startups? How do we support regional communities? How do we support anyone who has an idea? Um, and of course, in any of the go-to-market categories, whether that's DeFi, NFTs, consumer, um, but really, the core principle, popping up a level again, is about de decentralization is actually not just a buzzword. Um, it's real. And how do you, how do you, how do you uh, get $800 million to the people who need it? There is no way to do that without, without pushing that to the edges and empowering other people to do that. And so this is where we as an ecosystem cannot scale unless we're decentralizing, unless we're pushing control, unless we're pushing responsibility unless we're pushing empowerment to the edges. And so on the funding side, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. We're, we're, the whole point of that, of that package is how, how can you get the people who are passionate about a particular region, about a particular startup, about a particular platform, about a particular ecosystem, the resources that they need to bring in all the next, the next layer of people into their ecosystem. Um, and that's where sharding comes in as well. Um, and this is, this is, again, where the technology has to follow the principles. And the goal is to make this network more distributed, to make it more robust. Um, but sharding is also, it, it opens up more than just uh, technological scaling. Um, because by having more validator seats, it allows us to, uh, to use something called endowment funding. Uh, we haven't really made any announcements on that. But what it, allows, what it allows us to do, what it allows the ecosystem to do, is actually create sustainable funding models, long-term sustainable funding models for these regions, for guilds, for communities, related to them uh, running validators. And so it's not just about the technology, it's about what does that technology unlock for the ecosystem. Um, another note on the community side where decentralization kicked in is that, again, coming from, coming from that, that, that tiny little WeWork room, you always start with that, with that seed, that centralized seed, and then you have to progressively decentralize over time. And what we found in this ecosystem, of course, we, we had a whole bunch of very early builders, uh, forward-thinking people. And once, once, once the platform was, was launched, 
Everyone started, started wanting to build other stuff, wanted to build cool things, wanted to move in different directions. Some people wanted to, wanted to explore DeFi. Other people wanted to explore community tools. Other people wanted to uh, um, uh, support, support things more in the creator space. And so the core, core team members began spinning out. And, and that's, that's great. So we have people coming from outside with great ideas. We have people coming from inside with great ideas. And everybody's meeting in the middle. And that's, that's about not trying to, trying to do everything from one place. It's about empowering other people to go out and seize, seize what they see as the opportunity. And our job, I mean, speaking on behalf of the foundation at least, our job is just to make that easy for other people. Um, and so guilds is one of the most powerful tools that we have. And, and this is something that, that really differentiates Nier from a lot of other communities, which is that our guilds ecosystem, so guilds are basically communities. If you've been in gaming, you understand one version of guilds. If you were in the 16th century, you probably understood a slightly different version of guilds. Um, but fundamentally, the goal here is that everyone has a home. Um, everyone has a place where you can contribute. Everyone has a place where you can also receive value. And this, is, this goes back to that idea of it takes a village to make a successful ecosystem. And what guilds are, we have, we have over 100 guilds that are currently live. And guilds are basically DAO-backed communities on Nier. And they're communities that have a whole bunch of different categories. So some of these are what you might think of as, as more traditional geographical-oriented uh, meetups. Um, others are more functional. So we have a legal guild, which helps, helps startups within the ecosystem understand their legal and regulatory issues, incorporation issues. What should I do if I'm actually spinning up a guild? There's, there's all, there, there, are, there are meta questions involved in all of that. And the cool thing about it is that all of these guilds it allows anybody coming in from the sides to say, oh, well, I'm coming, I'm coming from in with a specific set of skills that I want to share with the community. And, and this gives them a container where they could do that, and they get funding. And it's based on a DAO, and it's decentralized. And uh, so, it's, so it's, both, it, it's both providing value to the startups and to the founders and to the ecosystem, but it's also allowing anybody an entry point, anyone who wants to contribute. There, there is a guild out there, and if there isn't, you should start it, and it'll get funded and it'll get the resources that it needs. Uh, not only that, these, as part of these communities, these, these guilds are incentivized to support the ecosystem with things like bonuses for sending people to, to, to win hackathons in the near ecosystem or, or referring projects for grants or things like that. So it creates a really beautiful mesh where everyone's incentives are aligned and we're all building together. And the important thing is that this is real. This is actually like these are happening on chain. So this isn't, this isn't about running a bunch of meetup groups from meetup.com or something like that. This is about actually using the technology and dogfooding it in a way that you normally wouldn't really be able to do. So I encourage you, if you're interested in that, um, near.org slash guilds. And we also have uh, a number of guilds wandering around. And so hopefully you've had a chance to talk to them. Um, another team that's, that's worth highlighting is the Ecosystem Success Group. And this, these, are, these are your Sherpas. Uh, I see Todd over there. <laughs> and basically, this is that it's, it's kind of confusing to, to build a project in an ecosystem that's as broad as this. And so how do we just make it easy? How do we, how do we say, you know, as a founder, you, you have a question that's kind of a weird, specific question that you're not sure who to talk to. Well, you have a single point of contact. And this is a group of people that, that they're actually moving towards running a guild themselves, uh, which, is, which is then going to allow anyone in the community to sort of become this support network to help, ever, to help the startups come together. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Jake, for, uh, for, for the graphic. Um, but of course, of course, this isn't about just like launching startups out of the gate. And uh, actually, one, one of the cool stories from the ecosystem success team is uh, th th there was a project that they were able to help, you know, and, and it's about sort of swarming resources together. It's like, oh, you know, you're, you're doing product development? Great, let's get you beta testers. Oh, you're, you're, you're coming out there and you need, you need people in Discord to, to, to try it for the first time, to start talking about it? Great, like how do we put you in touch with teams in the ecosystem that are doing marketing, with the Marketing Guild, Growth Guild? Um, and so they were able to, they were able to get this, this team, uh, over 1,000 Discord users in, I think, 24 hours which is pretty cool, just, just by organizing the resources that already exist. But if you want to go big, and this is the point, like we need to go big. This isn't, you know, right now we're small and we're going to be small and that's fine. Um, but in order to get big, this is where you actually have to start breaking out of just the thousand people in Discord. And you have to, you have to give applications the tools that they need to then grow themselves. Because the only way to reach a billion people is to create feedback loops. It's to, it's to allow these applications to reach out to normal people, again, to bring them from the social web, to bring them from wherever they are, um, to give marketers the tools that they need, to give uh, growth hackers, <laughs> um, growth teams, the tools that they need to use product-driven growth. 
Uh, and that's where I, I highly recommend uh, checking out the, the Gen C Growth Hackathon. Uh, and this is something that, to my knowledge, I haven't, I haven't seen before. Um, and we have, there are a series of teams that are building essentially growth toolkits. And so it's okay, well, if you have essentially more or less free NFTs, how do you use those? How do you use those as growth mechanisms? If we do a, a, a million NFT drop, how do you use those NFTs to reach out to new people from Web2? And how do you give, how do you give a, a team who's building a game uh, that toolkit to allow them to put some of their funding to work with these new primitives to then reach out to new people to bring into their game and engage, engage these users to up-level them, things like that. Uh, this is all stuff that, that again, it, working backwards from the technology and from the product, you can only do this if you have a, if you have a product that people are actually going to use, that they're not going to drop off at a 99% rate, right? And this is one of the coolest things about the Near ecosystem. This is one of the coolest things that's cooking. You've got Ross over there who's, who's driving a lot of this. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, this, this personally excites me because, because people, people don't necessarily, they don't build just to build, right? You build to create impact. And to create impact, you need users. And to find users, you need tools that actually allow you to find those users. And the best way to do that is to have those tools be embedded, to have those tools be native to the app and the ecosystem and the technology that you're using. And so that's where it's super important that we're putting together these, these growth toolkits um, that are based on, on blockchain primitives. And that's why I'm so excited about that. So I wanted to invite you. Um, the education team, you've heard them mentioned before, they're doing a fantastic job of putting a bunch of stuff together. And this is an area that's near and dear to my own heart because my background is also in education. They've put together a series of courses for pretty much anyone who's coming from any direction to uplevel themselves and get involved. So this may not apply to you, but this may apply to your friends. Do you have developer friends who want to learn Rust? Do you have developer friends who know Rust who want to learn smart contracts? Do you, have, do you have people who just want to understand what is blockchain? Um, there, are, there are boot camp models. There are learn to earn models. Um, all of this is coming together. A lot of this is actually coming together from the edges. And there are guilds now that are, that are driving education. There's funding for, for uh, developers and residents, entrepreneurs and residents, and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff that you should check out. Um, but in the end, the, the point is that there's a path for everyone who wants to get involved. And to pull it back, like. That's, that's, that's kind of what makes this cool and special, is it's, it's not just a rallying cry behind a big vision. It's not, just, it's not just a cool technology that does a lot of really awesome stuff. It's uniting all of those things together in a way that feels like everyone is working together to help make this possible for everyone else, right? It's bringing back the, the, the sexy <laughs> to being in technology a little bit. Um, and that's what's fun about Nier, is that, is that it's, it's, it's based in reality. Like, many of you bought tickets that, that are NFTs that are running on near like this is this is real today So again, we're not always very good at talking about it But there are people who are using these tools today the communities are running on near Today if you have ideas and you want to build and you want to help out It's there. It's launched the smart contract platform is running <laughs> I mean sharding sharding uh, if you go to Max's talk uh, He'll talk about in details about what's happening on the sharding roadmap But the point is you can build smart contracts today. You don't need sharding and of course the point of his talk is that you shouldn't have to care about charting either because it's all below the surface. Um, but my point is that, is that like one of the things that I think that just makes this special is that those core principles of, of the ecosystem comes first, of, of being open and, and transparent wherever possible and sharing knowledge and growing um, and ultimately, most importantly, creating experiences that feel simple is something that actually unites all of us in a way that I haven't really seen in a lot of other places. And that's kind of what brings the energy back. And that means that everyone here has a friend. I mean, you're already here. But everyone here probably has friends who are curious. Um, and there's, there's something for everyone to do. So come on in. <laughs> Join a guild. Start a guild, right? There, you, we need product people. We need designers. We need to reach out to people who aren't traditionally in Web3. Because th this has been a playground for technologists for years. That's, <laughs> that's not the difficult part. The difficult part is how do, we, how do we reach out to people who still feel like you know, maybe this industry isn't a good fit for them. Or it seems like a religious war on Twitter every time that they try to, try to even mention it. Uh, you hear that a lot from artists. How do you, how do you uh, cross the boundary where everyone seems to think that, that if, you run, if you launch NFTs, that these things are, are uh, you know, melting the ice caps in Greenland? It's like, no. <laughs> There's a path for everyone to get involved in this. And so I guess I just wanted to say what ties us all together is that, is that you're here and that this is a home for you. This is a home for you, this is a home for all of us, and I hope that we can together create this vision and make it feel at home for everyone else. Thank you.